So thank you both very much and um, away you go. All right. Thank you. Well done Green Institute for another excellent initiative and hi to all the members who are online. Good to have you here. Yeah. Hi everyone. This is really weird. This is the first one of these that I've done and it feels like we're talking to an empty room but we're just going to assume that you're all out there and that you can hear us. And, and uh, that you're laughing at our jokes. And that you think we're funny. <laughs> So um, because we're not particularly funny because it's been the end of a long day and estimates committees are still going, we thought we would lead with some first dog on the moon so that we don't have to provide you with our political analysis when dog is so much better. Um, this, so that's how dog put it. This is how Richard put it. Don't be fooled by this, um, the idea that it's boring or dull. Uh, it really can't be separated from the ideology that threw last year's budget at us. And it has entirely the same DNA and a lot of the same initiatives are still in there. And it locks in a lot of the initiatives from last time and so, builds on it as well. In that regard, presuming that you can all see this, we're not going to read the fine print to you because that would be a human rights abuse. But um, if you can kind of have a scan that goes to some of the detail about even though the government's tried this bait and switch approach and sort of like look over here, look at childcare, look at small business, a lot of the DNA of the 2014-15 budget is still there. So these are some of the bigger examples. Uh, and that sets us up, some of these things will need to be put through a Senate vote, so that sets us up for some fairly um, major contests um, down the track later this year. Is any one of those that you want to? Speak um, to? Oh, look, they're all they're all important. You know, the higher ed cuts are still there, even though we've blocked them in the Senate twice. The government still isn't getting the message. Hopefully, we can still block that. Um, the FBT changes, as you know, they've linked the um, increased childcare funding with taking money away from single income families. A lot of those are single mums who, obviously, many of them don't have a lot of spare cash, and so those FBT changes are really bad. Um, and the government needs to decouple those and they're starting to signal that they might in fact consider that, which is a step in the right direction. Um, as Scott mentioned, yeah, the health and education cuts are locked in from last time. Science is at its lowest ever funding in the history of when we've been taking notes of its level of funding. So that's um, bad news. The legal aid cuts that Brandis wreaked um, last year, some of those were reversed before the budget, not all of them and there's been no further changes in this budget. So there's still a net loss of legal aid funding, but it's not as bad as it was for a while there. And yes, yeah, so it dropped the six months without the dole down to a one month without the dole for students or the unemployed. Still can't eat if it's a month of no money. Um, so we've continued to oppose that change as well. Okay. So some of the slides that we'll get to go to the specifics of some of those things, but to start with some of the big picture, hang on, what happened there? there? Whoops, I just skipped, sorry, it's a bit incoherent. Here we go. Economic management, that the, the coalition trade very heavily and beat Labor up and certainly beat us up on the automatic assumption that they are better managers of the economy. Some of the budget headline figures really throw that up against the wall. Um, if you consider that a lot of the rhetoric around last year's budget was of the budget emergency based on uh, a deficit of around $17 billion and they've managed to double that, except that now we're meant to assume that everything is fine because the adults are in charge and the emergency has gone away. Um, unemployment is up and their revenue assumptions and their economic growth assumptions here and in the rest of the world for the next couple of years. I think are going to make it very difficult for them to sustain the projections that they've put in this budget. So this will just give you, I'm presuming that you can all see this change over as quick as we, as we do it. So that's basically income and expenditure since the Keating government, 93-94 budget, to the one that was just tabled a fortnight or so ago. And you can see um, that spending or payments is, is actually at an all-time high and that tax receipts are also growing, but that there's you know, a budget deficit obviously there for the 2015-16 financial year. So that whole kind of myth that you get a low taxing, low spending coalition government and then Labor blows everything apart and reverses that is really not actually borne out by the data at all. And unfortunately, a lot of economic debates in this country operate in, in you know, complete denial of, of the facts. So. If that's the stuff that you are keen on, it's worth 
that's going through this in a little bit of detail. That's just some background on what we were looking at in the graph. Oh, that's one interesting thing, I guess, that 80% of the expected revenue rises from bracket creep. So that's people being pushed by inflation um, and wages growth into higher uh, marginal tax brackets, which is not really a very honest way of taxing mm -hmm. people. Okay. This is the deadly deficit. And if you remember the, the knot that Gillard and Swan got themselves tied in and how they were pulverised by the Murdoch press for running budget deficits when they said they'd be running surpluses. You can go back to Wayne Swan, uh, not Wayne Swan, Joe Hockey's press club address in 2012. We said that we will never run a deficit, we will only run budget surpluses. But this is what they've I done to the books. funding to ABC or SBS either, or change health or education funding, Among or the pensions. Things. So, yeah. Okay, current deficit, forecast deficit, it's all looking pretty shit. So this is, these are our grown-up economic managers, no surprises, won't ever run budget deficits. So they're proposing to run the country at a loss well into the forward estimates. Look at these pretty graphs. Same with debt, even though it's relatively low by OECD standards and by historic standards and is not too terrifying in a low interest rate environment, they're still projecting debt to go up. And it's not borrowing, we're not actually borrowing to invest in public transport or energy transition or social mm -hmm. justice, we're borrowing to just cover the gap in spending so and, fossil fuel subsidies. and fossil fuel subsidies and goodness knows what else. So it's not even particularly smart debt or spending. All right, maybe we might ask, you know, I reckon you should I'll, cover I'll this. I'll go on this. What's I don't not quite understand budget? the significance of the Simpsons It's cartoon. a tumbleweed. Ah, I think it's a tumbleweed. Right. Okay, how do I make this go? Okay, so where is climate? Uh, nowhere on this government's radar. Of course, Hockey didn't mention it in his speech. I think Shorten made one throwaway remark about it at the very beginning and of course we highlighted it in our budget reply speech. Um, one thing that has found money for is of course Bjorn Lomborg, that famous statistician who touts himself as someone who knows anything about the climate but nobody believes him. Um, thankfully he's been chased out of town by the University of WA. Uh, but still the government wants to give him $4 million to set up some kind of climate crank institute somewhere, if anywhere we'll have him. Um, the other climate spending that's heading in the wrong direction is a new, basically a slush fund for northern infrastructure, which will include dams, but which we established in question time, which is something rarely happens, you don't usually establish anything in question time. However, the government did clarify that Galilee Basin mines and roads and rail and port ports would be able to be funded under this new $5 billion infrastructure slush fund and we know that the Galilee Basin is enormous and if all of the coal was burnt in that basin, that basin alone would be the seventh largest country emitter in the entire world. So um, wrong way, go back. Um, there was a tiny bit of extra money for Great Barrier Reef just while we're on environment generally, but it was taken from land care. Again, you know, apparently environment doesn't deserve any funding and we know that the environment department has, um, over the Fords, is going to lose one quarter of its staff. So um, it's bad news in terms of climate, but of course the fossil fuel subsidies, which I mentioned earlier, remain. We're still tracking at about 10 billion on those um, over the Fords and you never hear the government mention that. We've just had the first option under the new emissions reduction fund, um, which is basically yet another slush fund that polluters can now apply to get free money from um, for projects that they used to have to pay uh, to pollute. Now they can get some free money to not proceed with those things. And we established an estimate over the last couple of days that a lot of those projects were already in train and were going to happen anyway. And now they're just getting free money to do what was inevitable. Um, so it's a bit of a farce, it's a short version that's only going to abate about 0.5 of a percent by 2020 so far under ERF, which as we know the 5% target is a crock and inadequate, but 0.5 of a percent is just an absolute joke. So what else have we got? Pretty cartoon. That <laughs> <laughs> looks funny. That's, Ka read. that's Kathy Wilcox. Sticking the boot into the denialist. Okay, good. Have they found a home for the Lombard yet? Oh, not that I know of. That's pretty funny, isn't it? Poor guy's homeless. We should help him. We like helping the homeless. Right. So speaking of which, um, <laughs> again, I think it's part of our job is to point out stuff that's not in the budget rather than dwell on the talking points that the government's providing 
uh, and wants us to talk about. So one of the things that's clearly not there is the quarter billion or so dollars that was um, that was ripped out of housing and homeless affordability programs last year. None of that has come back. They've rolled the national rental affordability. They've basically cancelled out the national rental affordability scheme, and refusing to move on tax concessions like negative gearing or capital gains tax exemption. So you've got those massive incentives built into our tax system designed to privilege um, property investors, most of them up the wealthier end of the spectrum, um, but they've just been vacuuming money out of housing affordability programs. So we're going to keep talking about that despite the fact that it was clearly not in the, in the budget talking points. And when you consider that the largest single cause of homelessness is people, women and kids mostly fleeing violent households, uh, it, it's, um, it makes it Real yeah, all, all the more urgent that we actually start um, moving back to where we were. So on that, and you've got a really lovely detailed slide there if you're interested in knowing the full extent of the horrific funding cuts on DB. Um, just looking at some of the detail there, as I mentioned, some of that, some of those legal aid uh, changes had been reversed, but not all of them. So there's still a net less than what we had, say, two years ago. Um, there's still, uh, through that um, axing of NRAS, there's still not uh, appropriate funding for women's crisis shelters. And through the extension of NPAR, the homelessness agreement, there for only two years, even though it's traditionally a four or five year funded program, there's no certainty. And so the funding for those shelters likewise and for any long term affordable housing is just not is not there. Um, so clearly crisis response is a real problem. They've thrown a tiny bit of money at primary prevention, but with the same breath they're taking money out of respectful relationships programs in, um, for example, northern New South Wales. Uh, they had a very successful um, program that was helping about seven different high schools and by all accounts was working very well and you know helping to address the cultural and um, societal attitudes that underpin the incredibly uh, horrific stats of DB um, of which gender inequality is the driving factor. Um, and so they've cut that. So we are keeping a weather eye on that and continuing to keep the pressure up on DV. They've sort of got a bit of a window of political opportunity with so much rhetoric um, and that wonderful appointment of Rosie Batty as Australian of the Year. I think the government wants to be seen to be doing something, but we keep pointing out actually you keep making all of these cuts. Uh, so let's hope that the momentum is there this year for not just all of those remaining cuts to be reversed, but actually then some positive funding commitments. Okay. So that brings us to arts funding, and that was obviously not a huge announcement on budget night, but it's blown up quite significantly since then, and we'll get it stuck into this in budget estimates first thing in the morning, and maybe as a bit of an aside, this is to where Larissa was about to race off to. Um, all of the budget estimates committees where we get to go through these portfolios line by line and ask quite detailed questions about where the money's going or coming from, um, they're all broadcast. So you can go to the APH website and watch estimates committees live. And share our frustration that your question's never getting answered. Yeah, please join us. For 12 hours, no, more than 12 hours a day. What is it, 14 hours a day of no answer? For two weeks, yeah. For two weeks. So it's nice to know that you're there and you can hang around on Twitter and fire questions um, and snark. So the arts funding um, significantly, probably unless you've been under a rock, you'll have seen this. So mm -hmm. a net cut to the Australia Council's budget and to the arts budget, as we saw across most portfolios, not relating to burning fossil fuels, um, but more significantly pulling $100 million out of the Independent Australia Council and handing it directly to Brandis' own department. And tomorrow, I think Labor will probably go quite hard on this and so will we trying to get the sense of whether it's as bad as it looks, i.e. are these actually ministerial decisions because mm -hmm. Brandis has form on this stuff for funding his preferred uh, opera company, for example. Um, if that's actually where this is going, $100 million is a massive gouge out of mm -hmm. Commonwealth Arts funding. Uh, it's not a huge amount of money in the portfolio altogether, so ripping nearly half of it out and putting it into the minister's hands is a bit of a disaster. That has probably overshadowed some of the more subtle changes to funding and that again is the sort of thing that we can use budget estimates processes for. And then I think this last slide is basically how we re-raise revenue which we've been banging on about forever. 
and occasionally the media pays some modicum of attention to our proposals, but we've added up about $79 billion worth of revenue raising measures now. And I think we've listed all of those on the screen there. Obviously the key one is bringing back the carbon price, which would raise um, $18 uh, billion. And bringing back a mining tax that actually worked is about 10 from memory, but you've got the figure there on your screen. Um, axing those fossil fuel subsidies that we've mentioned a few times um, tonight and then a few other smaller ones that all add up to an awful lot of cash that we could actually spend on the services that people need and deserve rather than um, cutting family tax benefits and cutting paid parental leave and um, forcing people to tighten their belts um, unless you're a fossil fuel company or otherwise a big corporate. Um, so yeah, the super stuff's really interesting and it's, it's some of the other parties are starting to talk about that now. Unfortunately today the Prime Minister ruled out making any changes to super, even though hockey had sort of left the door open a little bit on that. Um, so who knows who's really in charge or how long any of them will last in their roles. But there seems to be a, a bit of a growing pace to discuss a, a fairer taxation system for super which would be really good because I think the figures are in about four years time we will forego as much on tax from super for the wealthy as we will spend on the aged pension which makes it a really stark um, illustration of how we need to fix that inequity. Mm. So all of those figures are estimated over four years and I think without exception they've all been costed by the mm -hmm. parliamentary budget office so they're numbers that are reasonably um, you know, they're verifiable and they've been modelled by sort of like ex-Treasury staff and, and economists. And that's really just, and this, this isn't our exhaustive list, this is just stuff that's in the field at the moment. We get these numbers updated and we'll craft this into more of an election platform as we get close to the election whenever that is. Um, so there, you can expect other announcements in different portfolios, but it's just really to prove the point mm. that none of these cuts that we're fighting in here are necessary. Mm. Um, if the government had the guts to take on powerful interests, we could raise significant amounts of revenue or save significant amounts of money. Um, that was all we had on the um, formal part of the presentation and we've still got Larissa for five or ten minutes before she's got race upstairs. Uh, Scott, just a question about the um, carbon price. It's going 18 billion potential revenue over the Ford estimates. I think that's what, four years is it? So, you know, um, four and a half billion a year. Um, are you assuming a carbon price there of $23 a tonne or $25 a tonne? And if that's the case, um, What's the, what's the sort of plan with regard to linking to international prices and would they be as high as that? Or is this, is this looking at a fixed price for, for into the future um, for the next three or four years? I think that it was a floating, oh, it's still linked to EU. Huh. It was, We're getting advice from our expert advisor. From our climate policy advisor who is worth his weight in gold. Okay, so Jay's saying it was a floating price that was still linked to the EU price. Okay, it's effectively reverting to where we were before they smashed it up. It's not necessarily exactly what we'll take to the election, but it was just to provide an order of magnitude of the amount of money that's out there. Mm. Uh, my question is that uh, I would have thought there might have been some attempt to move on some aspects of negative gearing, even in a, uh, suggesting a phased in change, and particularly the uh, capital gains tax as it relates to uh, uh, residential development uh, within the country. <coughs> Do you mean moved by us or by the government? Oh, well, I mean, you've got a shopping list there in terms of a green budget. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, I would have thought, given the problem with the housing market, uh, yep. that there, it's desirable that there be a move, but unlike Paul Keating's attempt, uh, there would have to be a phasing in period because otherwise you really uh, create a, a strong backlash. But uh, uh, the housing market's just uh, not possible for a lot of young people in the capital, a couple of the capital cities. Yeah, I strongly agree. Um, the reason that it's not on that list isn't because we don't care about it or that we're not thinking about it. Those are just things that have been launched and are in the public domain thus far. 
Um, we're looking at our options and we've got costed options on negative gearing, so watch this space. I agree with everything you've said there. You've got to be a bit careful about the phasing in. With distortions or tax concessions like this, if you ramp them out or phase them out over a long period of time, it can actually create really strange investor behaviour as people flood in to try and take advantage of things before you remove them. So our advice actually was to whatever your policy direction is on those things, to do it actually quite quickly. Um, <coughs> strongly agree with you on the housing market stuff and we would propose when we put some options into the public domain to transfer those concessions which collectively are worth sort of five to eight billion dollars a year are uh, transferred immediately into housing affordability and homelessness. So okay. we won't be long. And Dan, the mining tax fluctuates with the resource price. How would you manage this variable revenue source to fix cost expenses? Don't hypothecate it against anything. It was yeah. always something that was meant to throw money into the tin during the boom and it would disappear without harming anybody when things slid. Um, and I don't think we've had that one recosted by the PBO recently, but the majors, like the iron ore and the coal majors, even though the prices, the, the per tonne price has slipped, they are still making vast profits because the tonnages are now so high. So <laughs> a super profits tax would still uh, sort of skim the mm. that profit wedge off the top of the big ones, but obviously it's not going to hit the mid-tier miners or the juniors. Um, but sorry, that wasn't actually the question you asked. We never propose to put that to bank that revenue against, you know, health or welfare funding. That would be the sort of thing that if, if you could get it back, you would throw it into a sovereign wealth fund or use it to pay off debt or invest in big picture infrastructure and kind of one-off stuff. Excellent. A tax that fluctuates with an economic cycle is not necessarily bad. It can operate as a stabiliser, giving a boost when things are weaker and restraining the economy in a boom. See, I knew John would say that stuff better than me. Um, is there a clear, strong series of initiatives for the support and development of small and medium business coming? That means Greens ones, I guess. Feedback I get in the world is that the Greens are not interested in this area. How can we dispel this? Just drag down some of Pete Wish Wilson's speeches and hand them to them. So we brought quite a detailed small business policy to 2013. Mm -hmm. We'll have to adjust that now in the light of what's happened in this budget, but the government just introduced stuff that was quite similar in intent to our, to our policy. policy. Yeah, which always alarms. Yeah. Um, and just to elaborate on that slightly more, so we've been backing the um, company tax for small businesses, we've continued to oppose any company tax rate reduction for large businesses. Um, and in this budget, the government is indeed proposing a small business tax cut of one and a half percent. I think, from memory, we took a two percent cut to the last election. The government now wants a one and a half percent cut. Um, at the last election, we also took a policy of um, instant asset write-off being made permanent um, to small business, though not at the rate of 20 grand. The government's now proposed that that be effectively an uncapped for a period of two year availability. So you can just keep on spending up to 20 grand and write that off as an instant tax deduction um, for the next two years. Now, that's basically an economic stimulus package that they railed against when the other guys were doing just that, but it's targeted at small business. So we're alive to the potential for rorting there, um, but the concepts are not ones that are unfamiliar to us, but we'll, we'll have a closer look at the detail on how they propose to manage the, the potential for rorting. But yes, yeah, so we've, we've got a fairly solid position on small business that sometimes um, there's a variety of views on within the party. Some people think we're too favourably disposed to small business. Others like yourself say you hear that we're not so keen on it. So truth is kind of somewhere in the middle, I'd, I'd suggest. Hey guys, um, so a successful parliamentary strategy saw legislation to uncap university fees voted down twice, but as you mentioned, the budget now sends 20% less money to unis, and I'm interested in your thoughts on any further parliamentary strategies in the pipeline or where to from here. So I, it's probably a bit unsatisfying, I'd say in terms of direct parliamentary strategy, I would really want Lee in the room. She works, she is thinking about this stuff a lot, about how to kind of make sure that we don't lose that ground. Um, some of the direct budget cuts though are actually quite difficult to oppose because they put them in the main appropriations bill that we can't, or that, you know, we don't have any possibility of blocking. So unless it comes in in its own bill that you can have a fight over, Parliament actually gets cut out of that conversation and it doesn't come up for a vote. 
So we've got to come up with our own stuff is, is the short version. But look, I reckon that it, it's looking good, Holly, and thanks for your question. This has been a fascinating policy area because we've been able to stare down the Abbott government twice now with the crossbench for all of its colour and all of their peculiarities. People did actually stand firm and so there's a sense that um, you know they'll be embarrassed if they change their position. So I hope that there's some pressure there for people to maintain the stance that they have taken so far in opposing um, funding reductions and in opposing the deregulation fees so that fees would skyrocket beyond the reach of most people. Okay. Um, hi guys. Yeah, I was just, um, I guess it's a bit of a Dorothy Dixer, but I would be um, very interested to know what your views are on the, um, the fast of the last eight or nine days and um, what obviously um, to put, um, I mean, yeah, we're um, using our one-off resources, um, big corporations are throwing them off very cheaply and um, or anything, is it worth having an inquiry? What sort of policy should we be um, arguing for? Uh, it wasn't it wasn't really us driving that debate. It was being driven by Andrew Forrest, who basically mm -hmm. figured if there was to be an iron ore cartel, he wanted to be in it. And if he wasn't in it, he wanted if he to wasn't in it, it. <laughs> and he wanted it to stop. Um, <laughs> so we we didn't immediately jump jump in with a kind of yay twiggy response. But what's happened yeah, since then is so is, is really fascinating in the sense that. We're not really in the business of blocking Senate inquiries, mm -hmm. so I think we would act, we would have supported it if it had come through. But obviously the majors, BHP and Rio, then jumped really hard on Abbott mm -hmm. and Hockey and squashed it. And so um, my instinct would be, if it does come back, I don't think it will, but if it does come back, I would be driving it in the direction of uh, how vulnerable our economy is to bulk export of these really low value commodities. We have no control over the price. Probably the tie up between China and Brazil will have a much bigger impact on the future price of iron ore than any collusion by Rio and BHP here. And we'd be foolish to think that they didn't do that. Like they ramped up production massively because their costs are so much lower than everybody else's, which is absolutely driving the bottom end of the market out of business. They control the rail and port infrastructure up there, and Twiggy was a a bit of an unwelcome competitor. That's capitalism. So I think it's kind of funny for Twiggy to then come out and say somehow there should be some sort of collective pricing arrangement just because what's happening doesn't suit him. Let them stew, that's what I say. If we get the inquiry, we would be using it to drive quite different arguments. Mm -hmm. so I agree with the, um, the fact that we've allowed our economy to become very um, Dominated by the mining industry, and um, the, you know, to some degree, we've um, suffered from the um, what was that Dutch syndrome, where you Dutch um, disease. yeah Dutch disease, and um, yeah, so I'm very pleased that we're trying to push for a much more sophisticated and balanced economy. And uh, I, I I see the situation now, and I've, I've been asking the question for the last five years with uh, various friends: is what, what do we do after mining? And I think that. Recent events have sort of stirred that debate uh, quite extensively. And um, if you look at the industry in the UK, they did not have a solution, whereas the French, the Canadians did. You know, they 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 went on to uranium mining and and pushing the nuclear for low cost energy. Now, I'm I'm not advocating that, but I, I think that we can do a lot with the resources we've got in in terms of solar. Uh, particularly gas in the northwest, to sort of um, let, let industry and agriculture expand and all those kind of industries. Yes. I don't think we need to countenance uranium mining. I don't think we should countenance um, gas um, where it requires fracking. And I think we have so little time in terms of the, the greenhouse gas abatement task or in English, tackling climate change, that I think we can no longer rely on gas as a transition fuel. And report after report is telling us now we have the capability and the ability uh, to transition directly to renewables. So I don't think that a bridge from mining is yet more mining or gas mining. I think we can move straight to clean energy production. Obviously, some significant policy changes would be needed before that could occur, um, but we don't have the technology 
technological barrier and we've seen some wonderful improvements in battery storage, you know, massive drop in the price of, of small scale solar, large scale solar projects ready to go but they've been hampered because of the RET review. So I think in terms of just the energy sphere that the transition there is, is clear and it's possible. In terms of other industries, well it's about time we invested in our brains. We've seen a massive brain drain, it's not news to anyone, but we're seeing the lowest ever research and development and science funding um, ever. So uh, that's clearly the wrong way to go in terms of investing in our ingenuity and our innovation. Um, manufacturing has been damaged by the mining boom because of the high dollar. Um, if we are to be continuing to prop up, for example, our car industry, which is the remaining manufacturing industries that are focused on. Well, let's make sure that we're supporting them to build cars that people actually will want to drive, that are fuel efficient, that are electric, that are hybrid. So, you know, let's be a bit clever about the subsidies that we provide to industry and, and actually actively assist that transition process. Um, and then there's ecotourism and the tourism and the service industry, which is the bulk of our economy anyway. Mining is actually only about 7% of GDP. It's got this kind of mythical proportion in the Australian psyche, but the facts don't really bear out its actual importance in terms of economic bottom line. So I think we're well placed to make that transition and we've got a litany of options. The rest of the world's blazing the trail and we're getting further behind with every moment is the problem. Uh, the only things I'd add to that, I think it's a good question, would be around agricultural exports and telecommunications. And probably, uh, yeah, so advanced manufacturing, um, building and construction, I think you can kind of see a bit of a blueprint there that we're going to be sort of proving up as we get closer to the election for the economic sectors that if you actually had a national industry policy, you could be incentivising things underpinned by education and re you know, R&D funding for a much more diversified economy and telecommunications being a, a particular Preoccupation of mine, I guess. That we really jobs in the metadata storage. Oh, so. <laughs> it's getting late. I'm being trolled by my co-deputy, whatever. <laughs> um, but you know, we are in Western Australia, for example. We're in Beijing's time zone. We're in the we're in a time zone that stretches all the way to Eastern Europe. Uh, that you know, a quarter or a third of the world's population. We are really uniquely located to take advantage of that. Um, and I think. What the question, I guess, provokes for me is that the industry sectors that have benefited most from, from subsidies and the distortions in the economy are the same ones that, that basically say, oh, we shouldn't pick winners and that we shouldn't yes. support anybody else. We've got to get over that.